GV has had a clear vision and mission to support innovative founders to make a real impact in the world, particularly on the life science team. We're here to make an impact on patients' lives. And we're just so thrilled to have ERA Therapeutics as part of our portfolio. Uh, ERA has recently come off a uh, financing of $193 million. And we're thrilled to be here today with Akin Akinch, who's the CEO of ERA. Akin, tell us a little bit about your personal journey and maybe the, how did the conversations with ERA start? Funny story is it almost never happened. Um, Feng Zhang uh, of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard had reached out to me, sent me an email, and unfortunately went into my spam folder. <laughs> and I only discovered it uh, the you know later that week when I was in there looking for something. So um, fortunately, I, I, I did find it. Uh, Feng and I did have initial initial meeting um, to learn more. And, and as I learned more and more about Era. Um, you know, it became very clear it was, it was an exciting opportunity that I really just could not uh, pass up. What was exciting about it? Well, I think for me, you know, when I think about the opportunity, you know, it, it really starts with one, working on an important problem. Um, and obviously delivery of genetic medicines is, is a huge problem, uh, one that is highly impactful if, if you can solve it. Um, there was compelling science. Um, and you know a new approach to delivery of genetic medicines and but I think most importantly for me it was just the people that were involved and um, I think for me you know that starts with a world-class scientific founder um, and you know incredible set of investors um, with respect to GV and Arch um, in the lead and you know these are these are investors who want to build something for, for the long term that's lasting, um, that's impactful, and that was important to me. And, and then obviously the, the board members, um, you know, with uh, John Mariginori, who I've yeah. known for 20 years <laughs> as the chair, David yourself and Vicky Sato and, and Bob Nelson and Izzy with you as an observer on the board. I mean, I think you know, that um, not only are, are these, you know, and, and Josh Wolf uh, from Lux, not only are these folks investors, but they're people who have built companies successfully, who've run them. And, you know, for me, as, as a first time CEO, you know, that's critically important to be working with people who I respect and, and um, who I can, you know, learn a lot from as I, as I grow into this role. Can you tell us a little bit about the interactions with the board, with the investors, and maybe primarily with Fung? Has the scientific conversations have evolved? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, interestingly, although we were in similar orbits, you know, I had never met Fung before. I mean, obviously, I knew him and knew of him by reputation as being a brilliant scientist and, and incredibly productive. Um, but I think what I was struck uh, with in meeting Fung and actually interacting with him is just um, his incredible humility, kindness, and I think the other thing that I really appreciate is that Fung tends to have, as I'm sure you both know, a knack for knowing where the science is headed. Yeah. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, if there's something that Fung gets excited about, uh, I know that's something I should probably be paying attention to. And, you know, if I come across something, I'll reach out to Fung and say, Fung, you know, is this something we should be paying attention to? Or if he's not excited about it, you know, then I tend to want to ask, all right, well, what am I missing here? Um, so I, you know, I think he's someone that, you know, I try to learn a lot um, from and, and the interaction has been fantastic. We've seen over the last decade, and you've been part of this, mm -hmm. an, a revolution in the way we think about developing medicines and in particular, the advent of genetic medicines mm -hmm. that have the potential to just change the way we think about treating patients and potentially leading to cures. We've seen it with the work that you've previously done with RNA. We've seen that with gene therapy and now gene editing. But clearly one of the challenges we've had with all of these technologies is how can we deliver these genetic medicines to the right tissues in patients to make the kind of long-term impact on their disease that we're looking for. And I know that's obviously one of the key areas that ERA is thinking about. Maybe walk us through what is at the core 
of ERA's technology and how we think it can make an impact in this field. Yeah, uh, that, that's a great point. And I think as I reflected on the last 10, 15 plus years, I mean, it's been incredible kind of the explosion of new therapeutic modalities. And we can think about antisense oligos and RNAi therapeutics, messenger RNA, both for vaccines and therapeutics, kind of a renaissance in gene therapy, and then gene editing in all its various flavors. And that's continuing to advance. And But I think if we lo look at the field, the pace of advancement of the delivery technologies has not quite kept up pace. Uh, and, and as such, I think, you know, that's, that's been a limitation then on the application or the broad application of genetic medicines. Clearly there are already um, important um, therapeutics that are being developed from these genetic medicines, but I think everyone in the field would agree, you know, we're a long ways from reaching the full potential. Um, I think if we look at the delivery solutions that we have today, we can generally bucket them as viral delivery technologies, lipid nanoparticles, Galnac and other small conjugates for small payloads like ASOs and siRNAs, maybe a little bit of work on you know, extracellular vesicles, but that's kind of it. And, and so clearly we need more strategies and approaches because it's unlikely that there's gonna be one approach that's gonna work for all these technologies. So, you know, I think that's what ERA is all about and trying to bring a new, um, new strategy, a new approach forward with protein nanoparticles. Um, if we look at, you know, the limitations of today's technologies, I think, you know, obviously with some, there's safety and immunogenicity concerns, the ability to redose, um, and a big one is just the tissues that are addressable with these delivery technologies. So um, I think there's still lots of unmet need um, for different approaches. And if we think about what ERA is trying to do with protein nanoparticles, um, you know, it, it's really about trying to address some of those. And, and our focus is, is primarily on protein nanoparticles that are based on human endogenous proteins. And if we can do that, um, there's the promise that by using human proteins, um, those might be better tolerated. Um, we might have uh, lower immunogenic risk and may have the possibility of redosing. And so I think um, if, if, if we can achieve that, you can clearly see how in chronic indications, those would be advantages, um, the safety being able to redose. But, but frankly, I think even in indications that are intended to be one and done, the ability to dose higher, the, the ability to perhaps dose multiple times to titrate to an effect, I think could also be valuable even in um, you know, applications where it's not intended to be a chronic therapy. And then a big one I think is, is cracking new tissues. Um, you know, if you look at the pipelines today, it's a lot of ex vivo, um, in vivo, it's a lot of um, liver applications, maybe the eye, a few other tissues, but clearly, you know, if we could move some ex vivo applications in vivo or reliably, robustly get to tissues such as the CNS, the lung, kidney, um, heart, you know, I think we could greatly expand um, genetic medicine applications. And then I think finally, I uh, wouldn't want to underestimate the importance of manufacturing you know, some of these systems are very hard to manufacture at scale. Um, and, you know, that could be the difference between um, being able to address rare or ultra rare uh, diseases to then moving to more prevalent disorders. So I think, um, you know, there's a lot of room for us to be able to address some unmet needs. Let's dig in one, one level deeper on these uh, protein nanoparticles. Tell us a little bit more about what they are, how you make them, and what are you going to put inside? I mean, there are mm -hmm. a lot of options for what mm -hmm. kind of cargo these kind of novel delivery vehicles could potentially have. How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, if we start uh, with kind of the initial discovery and, and the work from Fung's lab that was published in, in August of 2021 in Science, it was really identifying human proteins that had a 
retrotransposon or retrovirus ancient origin. And, and the interesting thing about those proteins is that some of them may retain the capacity to naturally form capsid-like structures, to naturally uh, have RNA or DNA binding domains, uh, to be able to encapsulate nucleic acid cargos. And that's what, you know, um, you know uh, Fung's lab at the Broad was able to demonstrate in that paper that those systems could be engineered uh, to, to be therapeutic delivery vehicles. And that was an important proof of concept. So, you know, I think that's what ERA is, is focused on now. I think from a payload standpoint, we're, we're taking an agnostic view. And I think we want to understand which types of nucleic acid payloads could be loaded. My sense is that theoretically, we could load from small cargos like ASOs and siRNAs all the way to large cargos like um, gene editing machinery. And we've demonstrated some proof of concept uh, along those lines. But it's also possible that some of these systems are going to be better for small cargos and others will be more optimal for larger cargos. And that's what we really want to understand. Um, from, from how we assemble them, I, I think there are two approaches. And, and the early work that was done in, in the Jung lab um, and what was published in, in that, the science paper was using cells to produce these systems. So transfecting in plasmids, having these proteins be expressed, assembled, and secreted uh, from the cell. And clearly that's an approach that can be used. I think what we're excited about also is the possibility that these systems might be able to be put together cell-free and self-assembled. And you know, as we think about the future and using them as therapeutics, I think uh, for us, that's really an attractive path because I think that's uh, from a manufacturing control analytical perspective, I think that's much more advantageous. And that's what we're really focusing on is can we find the right set of conditions um, whether it's you know, buffers and processing to be able to assemble these um, kind of purified components together in desired ratios to get uh, the particles we want. So I think that that's a really an important direction for us. Akin, yeah, before ERA, you spent almost 20 years at El Nylum. Mm -hmm. Could you go deeper a little bit? How did that experience shape you as a scientist, as a leader, and, and prepared you to be the CEO of ERA? Yeah. I mean, great question, and as you might imagine, you know, doing anything for 20 years it <laughs> shapes you. Um, and, and I'm sure it's impacted me in ways that I don't even fully recognize, right? Because you take some of those things for granted. Um, I feel very fortunate to have, you know, spent almost 20 years at Al Milam. I started out at the bench, kind of in the early days, uh, started with a company what it was even smaller than ERA is yeah. now, um, working on the platform, delivery systems, and then I was also fortunate to then um, kind of be part of the development journey as a program leader and starting with therapeutic program concepts and moving those into preclinical development and then filing INDs and early phase one translation, which to me was, I think, one of the highlights of drug development when you first see that initial translation in the clinic and then got to be a part of late stage pivotal trials and filing for regulatory approvals, and then launch even. And so uh, that was an incredible experience, and I think it teaches you uh, persistence, if nothing else. You know, I think uh, it's not all success. It's not a linear path. There's lots of challenges and setbacks. And, but I think Al Nylum did a great job of just kind of one foot after the other and just continuing to move forward. And so if I think about the lessons that I take away, um, you know, I, I think there's a number of them, but, you know, the importance of culture, I think, is, is one that I take away. Um, the importance of focus and being goal-driven, um, following the science and data. And I think, lastly, having leadership that's focused on content yeah. in addition to just process. And I think those are all things that I, I would like to bring um, to ERA as well. I think it's an opportunity, as you've already talked about, to think about how you want to build a culture to achieve that vision mm -hmm. that you will create with the board for mm -hmm. the organization. I also found it as an opportunity to challenge yourself 
in what will make you a great leader. Mm -hmm. What are the, the credo, for lack of better words, that you will live by mm -hmm. and people look to you as their leader? Mm -hmm. I have extraordinary confidence mm -hmm. given what your experience has been and what we've already seen you do mm -hmm. at ERA that you're gonna knock it out of the park. But it's a, it's, uh, it's a journey for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, along those lines, maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, obviously right now you're in the midst of building, mm -hmm. but you must have a picture in your mind of what you want ERA to look like five years from now and maybe even beyond that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, tell us a little bit about how you think about that, what you dream about. Yeah. I mean, I, I think fundamentally we think of ERA as a genetic medicines company, right? And I think the goal is that we grow into that and, and we're not a delivery company or we're not a gene editing company. I think we're, we want to be a genetic medicines company. Um, and so that, that's the vision that we're building toward. Um, I think how we get there though is, you know, step by step and trying to address the big unmet needs that are going to help move the field forward. And, and that um, really right now is delivery. So by, by necessity, that's the focus right now. Um, but I think over time, um, it's, it's going to be much, much more than that. Um, and so, like you said, right now, you know, it's heads down. We're really <laughs> focused on trying to advance the platform, um, understand, again, how to put these systems together, how they behave in vivo, and, and learn how to engineer them. But, you know, look, if, if it's where do we want to be five years from now, I would hope that we're advancing a very exciting program in the clinic um, in, in five years um, and on our way and path to building a pipeline of medicines. I mean, certainly we knew immediately at that dinner that this was the type of company that the life science team at GV aspires to be part of because it's not an incremental change to the field if this plays out the way we hope it will mm -hmm. with your leadership this will be a game changer mm -hmm. and we'll take genetic medicines to the next level and those are the kind of companies that at gv we aim to be part of i think going beyond there right? you've been in the field of genomic medicine for a long time we've seen remarkable progress over the past 10 years we've seen the first product make it to patients we see a lot of companies being formed, new payloads, new ways of thinking about it. What do you think the future of genomic medicine looks like? Wow, that, that, that's a big question. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's interesting in that, you know, it, it offers the possibility of not only treatment, but cures, right, with, with some of these approaches and modalities. And, and I think people are trying lots of different ways. You know, there are lots of different approaches to treating these different diseases. For example, sickle cell, a good... Uh, Good example, right? Do you, are you activating fetal hemoglobin? Are you um, uh, repairing, um, you know, uh, globin B? Like, are you, um, you know, there's there's lots of different ways of doing. It. Are you doing base editing, prime, uh, ex vivo? People are going to look at in vivo. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch all these different modalities kind of mature over the next ten years, and they'll all have a place. But I think we're going to see. Um, which of them play bigger roles in a kind of the medical armamentarium. So I think that, that I think is yet to, to play out. You know, another big direction that we haven't talked about, I think is going to be, and, and people are starting to work on it, targeted insertion technologies, yeah. right? Where you can go in and actually, if you can do it in a programmable way, kind of replace whole sections right. of the gene as a way of, of addressing, you know, lots of different mutations uh, at, at once. Um, so I think that's going to be an interesting space to watch that could be a, a game changer. Um, you know, I think the other thing I look at if we look at longer term trends is, is what about personalization, you know, in terms of um, when sequencing becomes just very routine, you know, are, are you going to have a very bespoke treatment for a particular, you know, specific patient? And we have sequence-based modalities that are that can enable that. I think the interesting thing is gonna be, is the infrastructure and maybe some of the regulatory framework gonna evolve to, to enable that to happen. Um, so those are some of the things that I kind of look to. But, you know, we talked about 
delivery. I mean, that, that's going to be critical to enabling all of these because the payloads are getting more and more sophisticated and, um, you know, it's going to, it's going to require a lot of the delivery system to, to get those systems um, to the right tissues uh, in the body. Yeah, certainly one of the things that we maybe haven't touched on is that currently the gene therapies and gene editing technologies that have made it into the clinic are largely doing that work outside the body with mm -hmm. cells that have been taken from a patient and then given back to the patient as part, almost as part of a transplant. Mm -hmm. But tell us a little bit about, you know, the vision of trying to create a genetic medicine that can be potentially given intravenously and uh, in a much uh, easier way for patients to receive. Yeah, I mean, I think that that would be huge. I mean, I, I think right now, uh, it, you know this much better than I. I mean, th those transplant type approaches are quite burdensome uh, and uh, challenging, but it, it's a it's a reflection of um, the tools at our disposal, right? If you work ex vivo, you have a lot more uh, delivery tools. You can use electroporation, for example, as a way to kind of in a more mechanical way get things into cells and also a way to kind of select um, cells um, to ensure that, you know, you have corrected cells that are going back. If we can improve the delivery systems on both those aspects, we might be able to move that uh, in vivo and, and greatly simplify these treatments and make them much more accessible too. I think, um, you know, these type of ex vivo approaches um, are complex and not ones that you can do everywhere. There's going to be very specific places that are set up to do that. And you're getting ready to move into a new facility. And I know Izzy and I took a tour the mm -hmm. other day. Mm -hmm. Not much in there yet, but <laughs> tell us a little bit about when you're moving in. Yeah, we're really excited. I mean, we're going to be moving back to Kendall Square uh, in the Tech Square area right, right down the road here. Um, and we're going to be moving in in midsummer. So we're just getting the space prepped for us. Um, but we're really excited about making that our home um, for, for the longer term. So, um, you know, I spent many, many years here within a few blocks, you know, first at MIT, um, right across the street uh, in E25, uh, yep. and, then, and then for many years at uh, 303rd. Um, so I have enjoyed my little sojourn uh, in the seaport area, but I'm very excited to, to come back to Kendall Square. We're looking forward to welcoming you as a neighbor here. <laughs>